Happy Labor Day weekend, everyone. Hey, we've got a lot of ground to cover today, so I want to dig right in. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. I'm going to start off with the first three verses. Literally, this could be the whole sermon. In fact, I'm going to land there for quite a bit of time. Hope I can do justice to the rest of the chapter, but please listen. Watch this in your notes up on your screens. Verse 1, but false prophets arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the, ba- the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their sensuality, and be- because of them, the way of the truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. When the first word of a chapter, of a new chapter of the Bible, opens with but, which is what happened in verse 1 there, it's important to go back and see what the but was referring to. So if you jump back just a chapter to 2 Peter chapter 1, it says this at the end, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy has ever been ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Spirit. So what Peter is saying there is that the false teaching that he's writing about derives from someone's own interpretation or opinion not from the scriptures themselves. Now folks, clearly there were and there are false teachers, some of them that are simply evil. They are masquerading as spiritual people telling us that they've heard from God, but in truth their motivation generally can be boiled down to money, greed, sex, or power. And the Apostle Paul, a Peter here, he's making it abundantly clear that godly justice will befall them. And, and why is his language so strong? You're going to see it gets even stronger as I go through this chapter. Because false teachers had the potential back then to lead these early Christians astray from God to lead them far away from God. And frankly, folks, false teachers still can do that today. See, in the Old Testament, they had a zero tolerance policy, zero tolerance policy when it came to false teachers. They were put to death. So how can we differentiate between false teaching and God's word? Folks, the first step is the scriptures have to be our baseline, right? They have to be. In Acts 17, 11, when early Christians were hearing about this message of Christ, it says in Acts 17, 11, they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. Northway, we have the fundamental responsibility to weigh what we are taught and then subsequently what we believe against God's word. And that does not mean that there won't be differences of opinions. A Lutheran theologian credited with this powerful quote. Maybe you've heard this before. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. See, in these first three verses, Peter also clearly states that there will always be false teachers among us. See, I believe much of the false teaching today is not necessarily of the blatant evil variety. And I know it's out there. But but I believe that much of the false teaching today that we deal with is misguided teaching. It's often very, very subtle. And may I even go as far as to say careless. And I think we will see, really, as we dig into this text, that not much has changed from what Peter was railing against some 2,000 years ago. 
Folks, where are the origins of false teaching? Where can they be found in the Bible? I think we have to go all the way back to Genesis and and look at the roots of our broken world and that's where we'll find the origins of false teaching. I believe some people, see when I say this thing, that we live in a broken world, right? I think we get that, but I think there's some people that are much more dialed into it than others. If you're an oncologist, I think you're dialed into the fact that this is a broken world that we live in. Healthy and vibrant people come to their office for cancer treatments, and they sometimes have to unfortunately watch people deteriorate right before their eyes. They are dialed in to the fact that we live in a broken world. Somebody that works with abused children is dialed into the fact that we live in a broken world, right? But for most of us, I don't think we're as dialed into this. For for most of us, every now and then there's an event that lifts the fog, right? A movie theater gets shot up. A bomb goes off at a marathon and we say, my goodness, there is something wrong with this world. Mainly though, I think the way that we know that the world is broken is this low-grade sort of burning that goes on inside all of us that tells us something is wrong. We know that something is disconnected. It's almost as if our, like our souls are whispering to us, there must, there must be something more here. That, that this world that we live in This isn't the way it was created to be. In sermons, I've often referred to this as this eternal ache, right? It's internally, we ache for things to come back to the way that they're supposed to be and that the way that they will be someday. So come back with me, back to Genesis 1, back to the way that it was supposed to be to be. See, one of my favorite musicians is a guy named Citizen Cope. You know, Citizen Cope, he brings this sort of soulful rhythm, hip hop. It's almost like an urban sort of vibe. Um, And I've always enjoyed it. And in Genesis 1 and 2, there is this soulful rhythm that is established. Come on, track with me on this. See if you can feel that vibe, okay? Let's have a little bit of fun here. See if you can feel that vibe. Let's go back to Genesis 1, huh? You getting that? When my wife and I first started dating, we would go dancing. She used to sometimes say, I don't know whether you're boxing or dancing. I don't know whether to hug you or duck. So that's my dancing style. So come on, Genesis 1. Feel this ribbon. In the beginning, right, God created the heavens and the earth. Out of the overflow of the triune God's goodness and gladness and perfect relationship with one another, God began to paint on this canvas of creation. Now get with me on this. The triune God did not create us because he was bored. Absolutely not. The God had existed in perfect peace and rhythm. And in that place, they started to create God the Father, the author, right? You got it? God the Son, the force behind it all, and the Holy Spirit, the personal presence of God began to create. And in Genesis 1 and 2, it says that they nailed it, right? You got that? You know what it starts off with, right? God began to create, and he said, he created this, and he created this, and it was what? It was good, man. Did you feel that? It was good. God created the earth, God created the seas, and they were good. In the original Hebrew, chapters one and two, it's really, truly a rhythm that is happening in these scriptures. Trees and stars and skies were completed, and it was good. Do you feel that rhythm? East End and Oakland, I know you got it. Wexford and Swickley, I'm not quite sure you're tracking with me, but so right, you got fish and birds and livestock, and it was good, right? Everything is in harmony when this is going down on this canvas of creation. It's shalom. It's this perfect peace. And in the middle of this perfect peace, he takes man and he takes woman and he puts them into that place of perfect rhythm. And he gives them what? 
one rule, one rule, one very clear rule in Genesis 2.15. Don't eat from that tree or you will die. A rhythmic, beautiful place that's been created. So get this now, you've got this naked man and this naked woman put into this perfect place. No death, no disease, no pain, no shame. And he tells them, listen man, name some animals. Tend to this beautiful place. Have a blast. Get it on. He says, be fruitful and multiply, right? But unfortunately, he says, just don't touch that tree. And we know what happens, right? The rhythm in Genesis 3, it's destroyed. Because as Eve is walking through the garden with her passive husband, Adam, the serpent starts lying to Eve. What does he say? Did God really say that you couldn't eat from the fruit on that tree? This is it, man. This is the first false teacher in teaching is now present. And the serpent smooth talks Eve. Come on. Surely he, you won't die, right? Surely you won't. You can, you know, be your own God. And by the way, folks, Adam is right there. So dudes, don't be trying to blame, you know, we always try to blame Eve on this. Adam is right there. I mean, what is this dude doing as the Satan is, is lying to his wife? He's like, hey, look, there's that kangaroo that I named, right? So Genesis 3, 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eye and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And in that moment, you gotta get this, that rhythm is broken. You gotta get this, man, that rhythm is totally broken. And the world turns into outright rebellion against the king of glory. And the world is fractured. Funny song over top, but you gotta try to get what I'm going at here. This rhythm, this peace, this shalom is over. Satan has taken God's very words and twisted them. And that's so often what false teachers do. And Adam and Eve, they, they run into the trees and they're playing hide and seek with God. And he calls them out for an explanation in verses eight through 13. And then in verses 14 through 19, this is tragic because it's the complete reordering of creation from how God designed it to be to what we currently live in right now. Where there was rhythm, there is now strife. Women, childbirth will be excruciating. Work will become toil, it says. Death is introduced. Unbelievable violence will run throughout all of creation. The universe is literally thrown into chaos. Sin is in the world and everything is changed. It is busted. But you gotta hear this. You can still hear the rhythm in the background. See, at times we can still hear that. We know the way that it was supposed to be. At times we can experience it. There's these moments in life where things line up and they're good. But that eternal ache just at times just overruns it. Because we live in a broken world. This is very important. I put this up on the screen. If there's something I really want you to grab out of this sermon, it's this. Since the fall, False teaching has been a response to make sense of a broken world. When things are unexplainable, folks, when we do not like what the scriptures say, we insert or follow a softer or false teaching. In Peter's letter, what was the false teaching that rose among the people? Most commentaries and scholars say that it's centered on two issues, two areas of false teaching. The first is this. This was this believing in a false sense of freedom. And at the heart of this is the term licentiousness or licentious living. And the dictionary defines it as this. Lacking legal or moral restraints marked by a disregard for the rules of correctness. One commentary I was reading about licentiousness says this, what a subtle thing licentiousness is. It makes you think you are free when you are in bondage. 
It is the vice of the enemy whereby he deceives folks into thinking they are really free when in fact they are locked up by their own indulgence and sin. Yet, they're convinced they are entitled or in control. Another tough statement right here. Smooth talking false teachers of this time were prostituting Christ's beautiful grace by packaging it as freedom to do whatever you please. Basically, they're saying, hey, you're forgiven. You're free in Christ. So go live life to the full. Don't be concerned about your soul or where you're going to spend eternity. Do whatever you want. Do whatever feels good. The people of this time were saying, if the apple is a delight to the eye, if it tastes good, eat it. Be your own God. See, licentious living is bending or abandoning the truth. It's just refusing to live as Jesus commanded. It's as if we're saying, you know what? God is, you know, if God is so good, then it's all going to work out fine in the end. Is that type of thinking still prevalent today? Sometimes I wonder that over 2,000 years, I, I don't think things have really changed that much. In verses 4 through 11, they're in your notes, and I'm just going to touch on, the, on it real briefly. The, the, basically, it's four scriptural examples of God's judgment on false teachers. And if I could summarize that section of this text, it would be this. One, false teaching and teachers are to be expected. Two, people will be led astray. Three, their teaching is full of deceit. And four, they will ultimately be punished. And for the record, the punishment part is emphasized and mentioned in verse 5, 6, 9, and 10. Our God does indeed say, but please do not forget that our God punishes. False freedom in Christ, licentious living, is this first area of false teaching that the letter that Peter wrote was addressing. And I'm going to come back at the very end and touch on the second thing, that, that sort of the false teaching that, that rose up in this community. Pastor Doug Melder passed a book on to me a few weeks back titled Bad Religion by Ross Dothat. And in that, this is what he said about false teaching in this country. Conservative and liberal, political and pop culture, traditionally religious and fashionably spiritual, Christianity, place, place in America's life, has increasingly been taken over, not by atheism, get this, but by heresy. Debased versions of Christian faith that stroke our egos, indulge our follies, and encourage our worst impulses. That's a, that's a pretty powerful statement right there. Now, now first, let me say this. I believe every word of this book. You got it? At times this book is challenging and I struggle to follow it, but it is the truth. But hear me on this, when me or, or one of the other pastors discuss a book in a sermon like I, I just did, let me be clear, it's just a book. It's not the Bible. And I felt like this book made some really strong generalities about some of the false teachings that are in our culture today. But I am endorsing it as a good read, not as absolute truth. So if you choose to pick up that book, and I wrote it in your notes, you got to put on your big boy and big girl pants and prepare to think. Because it's not an easy read, and I don't necessarily agree with all of it. But in Dothad's book, he identifies four false teachings that he feels are prevalent in today's American culture and in the church. And he connects them in the book to teachers and celebrities and leaders, and that's the part I'm not quite sure I line up with. But here they go. I'm going to go through them one at a time. I'm going to give you the names that he calls them out in the book and just describe them briefly, see if you recognize any of these. This first is what he calls lost in the gospel or revising Jesus. This false teaching, it says this, the scriptures as we have them, the Bible, have been manipulated by force or by fraud. And therefore, we must discover the historical Jesus through uncovering lost texts and gospels. 
If we do this, then we're going to have the true picture of Jesus, a more appealing and less controversial Christ. This teaching says that the only Jesus that really matters is the one that you invent for yourself. Folks, this is the stuff of the Da Vinci Code or buying into sort of the lost gospels of Thomas. Sort of a softball, right? To get us started. Here comes a few fastballs. The second one he identifies is pray and grow rich or health and wealth. If you lack blessing in your life or if you're experiencing poverty, suffering, etc., you simply need a bigger vision and a stronger faith. If you increase your faith and your good works, you will access God's best for you because God ultimately desires to increase you financially by giving you promotions, good breaks, healings, divine connections, or material provision. I was in Haiti a couple weeks ago. I met some people with a lot bigger faith than me and much more godly vision that did not have two pennies to rub together. This is false teaching, folks. The third one is this, the God within, or the spiritual, not religious. This is where it says it's important to be spiritual, focusing on meditation or internal harmony, so that you can come to an awareness of yourself mentally, spiritually, and psychologically. The God of the universe can be the God within you through contentment. This is a choose-your-own spirituality teaching. And through contentment and therapeutic niceness towards the world around you. Much of this teaching is, is wrapped up into sort of this all roads lead to heaven spirituality that I believe is prevalent in our culture today. And the fourth one is this, the city on the hill or America as Israel. And this is when we create a link between religious apostasy and the decline of American Christianity. In this teaching, America is the new Israel, a holy nation set apart, a city on a hill, a promised land with a manifest destiny. All must strive to do what God would have them do to advance this Christian nation and usher in a time of prosperity led by God's chosen nation. This is when God's movement across the globe is ignored or in some way comes under what is happening here. Hear me on this. In the garden, Satan took God's words and subtly turned them to deceive Eve. And that's what these teachings are. And folks, if scripture is our baseline, all roads do not lead to heaven. Israel is God's chosen nation. God never promised you a big bank account. And you are not your own God. And frankly, more of us pastors and more of you Christ followers need to be saying that. Back to, first, to, back to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, it continues to describe false teachers and teaching. And it says this, But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls that they have hearts trained in greed accursed children forsaking the right way they have gone astray and folks I just want to sum this up the tragic aspect of this section that I just read to you is that false teachers and those that have bought into the false teaching are now being rebuked and called out together and you got to understand the implication of that that means it's the same punishment on those that are doing the false teaching and those that have bought into it and are carrying it out. And if that doesn't shake you up, I don't know what will. You know, one phrase that jumped out at me is verse 14 where it says, they entice unsteady souls. False teachers and teaching entice 
unsteady souls. And studying that phrase, I came across two characteristics of an unsteady soul. So let me just ask you a question. Might you be vulnerable to be led astray by false teaching? There's two characteristics that would maybe tip you or lean you in a way that you might be susceptible to false teaching. And they are this. One, it says that they have a defiling desire. So again, this isn't talking about the false teacher. This is talking about someone that's, that could be enticed by the false teaching. Defiling desire. This is when you have a tendency to corrupt or taint others. Now, what do I mean by that? Because this is tough to describe, but it's something like this. It might be when you think to yourself, man, I know I'm off track. And I realize that some of the stuff I'm doing is not necessarily godly. Therefore, man, I really sort of desire others to join with me in it. Individuals that are susceptible to false teaching, unsteady souls, are often those that tend to tempt or push or encourage others into immoral or ungodly behavior. Is that you? Number two, it says they despise lordship. They disrespect proper human authorities in the Christian community and often then question Jesus' authority over their lives. It's this tendency to be willing to be willing be unwilling to submit to Christian authority, which leads to the lack of proper respect for God. So are you currently exhibiting characteristics or behaving like an unsteady soul? I am. Because I'm a broken vessel living in a broken world. See, I believe that God put that one tree in the garden and told us not to eat from it because he was trying to reveal the fact that obeying him is where we can truly find joy. And Adam and Eve did not want to obey, and so often neither do I. And therefore, when a softer gospel or some false teaching comes along, at times, I am all ears. This is a battle. Northway, you've got to hear me on this. You are in a battle. Remember that Peter is not writing this letter to pagans or worshipers of other gods at this time. He is writing this letter to Christians, to believers. So how do we stand for truth? Or maybe the tougher question is this. How do we stand for truth in a pluralistic society like the one we live in? And what do I mean by that? I tried to define it here. A pluralistic society is any society in which citizens can legally and publicly hold multiple competing ethical views and are allowed to choose for themselves what ethical beliefs, if any, they wish to hold to. And folks, I think so often we focus and lead, we lead with being accepting of others' viewpoints. And I get that. But sometimes I think what is driving that is that we just want to be accepted. And I believe we should and we can at times say to people, hey, I, I accept you and I accept that that is your opinion, but I don't endorse it. And I think this is a very tricky place. But in the middle of this space, hear me on this, we have to lead with love, not acceptance. In this space, we are often so concerned because we don't want to risk being labeled old-fashioned or intolerant or closed-minded, or even hateful, and we go too far in the direction of accepting. And I think we need to be able to get to the point in this culture and say, I accept you. I understand where you are coming from. I see how you have arrived at that conclusion. However, 
based on my baseline of Scripture, I disagree with that conclusion. I am called by God to accept you, but I am not called to endorse you or that opinion. And when I say I believe that something is ungodly or immoral or unscriptural, I know that I am leaving myself open to be criticized. But there are things with the scriptures as my baseline I simply cannot endorse. And by me accepting you does not mean that I endorse your belief or your behavior. I I had a young man, Christian young man, come the other day that just was struggling with his relationship with his girlfriend. And one of the first questions I asked him, are you guys living together? And he said, well, my guess is that you're probably sort of old-fashioned when it comes to that. But yes, we are. And I said, that is your opinion. And I accept your opinion. And I love you. But I am simply not going to wink at that or endorse that opinion. You are living like you are in a covenantal relationship. You are sharing pets, you are sharing a house, having sex as if you are a married covenantal relationship. But you are actually, my friend, in a contractual relationship. And as long as you are meeting whatever expectations you have stipulated with one another in the contract of living together, everything might be okay. But when you don't and when you have troubles, it's going to be because you're living under a contract and not under a covenant. I don't endorse it. I have another friend, a dear believer in the Lord that's chosen a direction for his life that I completely disagree with. And he continually sends me articles and writings in order to get me to agree with his opinion. And I told him, I accept that that is your opinion. And I love you. But I'm not going to endorse that. You can stop sending me that stuff. Folks, we can step up and say that as believers. I had coffee with John Riley, the associate pastor at our Oakland campus a few months ago. And we got onto this topic. And here is what he said. I liked it so much, I actually, we sort of wrote it down together. And John said this. When it comes to many controversial issues, my stance is a matter of authority, not a matter of opinion. There are even times when my opinion doesn't quite line up with what Scripture may clearly teach. But I have submit to the authority of Scripture because I trust that God's wisdom is higher than my own. A few times over my years following Jesus, I have found that in areas where I have submitted to his authority, even when my opinion differed, my eyes are opened up to the wisdom of his word and my opinion has changed. It's an emerging leader. I think we can learn a lot from our young men and women emerging leaders around this church. I mentioned earlier that there was a second issue of teaching, of false teaching, that most scholars believe Peter was addressing in this letter to followers that had been led astray. And it's this. They were scoffing at the second coming of Christ. See, see, they were teaching that there is no second coming, and therefore there is no final judgment. That they were claiming that there, there is no final accounting to God, and that is dangerous. And I believe that's why Peter took almost all of chapter 3 of this letter, aimed at discussing and talking about the second coming. And it's why we've decided to take chapter 3 and make it a three-part series that will kick off next week. See, I believe in divine justice. A God that saves as well as a God that punishes. Adam and Eve, they were led astray by some attractive and clever false teaching. And they headed into the woods to play hide and seek with God. And when called out, they started pointing fingers at each other and anything else in sight. Some of us are hiding in the trees right now and playing hide and seek with God. We've been drawn away by false teaching. 
We're living lifestyles that are based on our own opinions rather than on God's word. And we're blaming everyone and anything in sight when others don't agree. And all the while, folks, you know something is not right. And you can hear that rhythm of the way it was supposed to be. But it's so faint and so distant. There's something in your soul that's burning because you know something is not right, something is missing. When we played hide and seek together as kids in my community, when we were little, what was the phrase that signaled that the game was over and you can come back in? Anybody know or what you said? All right, ollie ollie in come free, right? Ollie ollie in free. Some of you need to hear that today. Ollie ollie in free. Come on back home. Stop hiding in the trees. The game is over. He found you. He paid the price for you on a cross. And there is a beautiful rhythm and freedom and joy that can be found in obedience to his teaching. Now, across all campuses, Northway, will you stand up with me right now? I just want to pray over you and specifically over some of you that are playing hide and seek. You're bending the rules or ignoring God's teaching. And can I just pray right now? God, at, at all of our campuses, right now I know that there are folks that maybe went out and went away from your teaching and thought they could just take a few steps away. But now they find themselves way out in the woods, lost. Lord, I would ask that right now you, you would call them home. That they would literally hear your voice saying, come on back home. My teaching is good. There is joy that comes in submitting to my word. I lift all these things up in your son's name. Amen. You can have a seat right now. I mentioned that we kick off a brand new series. Um, three weeks, interesting topic, the end, right? End times. And I, we're gonna be creative and have some fun with it, but I don't want you to lose this. This is crucial teaching. Because if you really don't believe in a final judgment, if you don't really believe he's coming back, do what you want, right? So take a look at this video, sort of give you a little idea of where we're going. I really encourage you to come back and invite some friends.